So welcome everyone to the first science seminar series of the semester. Um, talks are going to be happening every Friday um, at 2.30 p.m. in this room, Brody 447, and as well as on Zoom. Um, the only caveat to that is November 15th on the reading break, there will be no talks that week. Um, on this note, next week's talk on October 4th uh, is going to be given by Dr. Uh, Kristen Kita, uh, a postdoc from the University of Northern British Columbia in Prince George. Uh, Dr. Kita's talk is going to be on the impacts of wildfire smoke on watersheds in Northern BC. Uh, the talk will be given by Zoom, but it will be up here on the screen as well uh, for people who want to attend in person. Uh, the Zoom option will also be available, of course, and we hope you, you will join us again for that. Um, for today's talk, uh, we're very pleased to be joined by Dr. Marika Lazinski, an assistant professor from the Department of Psychology here at Brown University. Um, Dr. Lazinski is also a licensed clinical psychologist here in Manitoba. Her research and clinical interests align and include supporting young people's mental health, their emotional regulation, and their family functioning. Her recent research is focused on young people's use of coping and emotional regulate, emotion regulation strategies during the transition back to in-person functioning following the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Dr. Lazinski's talk today is titled COVID-19 Pandemic Recovery, Exploring the Mental Health of Young Adults During the Transition Back to In-Person Functioning. Following Dr. Lazinski's presentation, uh, there will be time for questions and discussions from the floor and on Zoom. Um, so if coffee comes, feel free to help yourselves and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Lazinski. Um, okay, thank you for having me. Uh, a lot of what I was going to say from my introduction, so I'm very thinking this. So I know this uh, this title is quite a mouthful. Um, I was trying when I so I've been here in Brandon for three years now. Which doesn't feel like it because the first year we were all still heavily under COVID restrictions, so I met very few people. <laughs> um, and and then the next year we were doing this weird back and forth transitioning thing. I don't know if you guys remember what you guys were doing in terms of school, but here for sure there was a lot of like, we're back in person. No, we're back online. We're back in person. No, it's not safe, we're back online. Um, and so it was it was a bit of a, a confusing, stressful time for everyone. And eventually we did settle into being on um, in person again, of course, but it, it took a while and it wasn't like a very clear thought out way of doing things. So at that time, I thought it would be really interesting to do a little bit of research into how our young people were doing with that transition. And I called it the transition back to inclusive functioning. The government called it COVID recovery. It was all recovering. <laughs> So anyways, that's why it's a mouthful. I don't know what term to kind of stick to, but that's the time I'm talking about. Okay, so um, as Carson, Carson, yes, as Carson said, I am a clinical psychologist, so I am very much interested in young people's mental health. Uh, before I came here, I spent the last 10 years working with young people uh, directly in clinical services, both adolescents and young adults. Um, with lots of different mental health conditions, but uh, one of the things you guys may be aware of is that there is um, a lot of concern about young people these days, right? There's been a lot of talk about a decline in mental health. Um, I'm deep into the anxious generation, highly recommended if any of you are interested. Um, there's a lot, a lot of talk about a lot going on, so it's good timing. So young adulthood, I will just define this for you. Uh, in terms of this study that we did, um, typically, if you define it very broadly, it's between 18 and 35 years. It was quite a large span, and that's because lots of things are going on during that time, typically a lot of transitions. So young people are moving away from home, perhaps. They are either going off to, to school like you guys, or they're starting full-time employment, perhaps graduating high school, um, perhaps starting a new family of their own, moving in with a partner or even having kids. So there's a lot kind of going on during that time. And there's no like set rule for when those things should happen. So that's why the age gap is quite large. Um, some people would define it more narrowly as 18 to 29, but we wanted to go so far. 
So we were looking at what is going on with, with young people. Um, one of the things we knew is that, like I said, mental health of young people has been declining probably since about 2008. Um, and they are actually the lowest, um, the group to report the lowest mental health of any age group. So um, it's quite a concerning trend and it's been going on for a really long time. The other thing we knew is that COVID research that had been done thus far had really focused in on our switching to online functioning. So going from our regular in-person interactions to our like social isolation and all of that awful stuff we all had to deal with. Um, and, and, and we did, we saw kind of big drops in terms of mental health of young people as well as, as adults and kids and families and pretty much everybody was struggling, uh, but we, we kind of left it there. There wasn't a lot of new information after that. So I was really interested to know whether we were actually going in the direction that the government was saying, and this was kind of like an upward trend. We were recovering from COVID. Everybody was getting back to where they had been prior to COVID. Or the other thing I was thinking was that um, it's, it's possible that any transition is stressful, let alone one where we are moving back to more face-to-face -face interaction after a number of years of not being face-to-face. -face. So some people are really used to that. We have lots of people who, who still want to use that technology and that's I think that's pretty legitimate, but um, yeah, for some people it's very scary to be back in person, either because of social interaction or um, they were still really afraid of COVID and getting sick and what it might do and how it might influence, um, you know, their family members or whatever else. So I think it was it potentially a very stressful transition. Um, there was a lot of uncertainty. There was a lot of like double sided messaging in terms of whether it was safe or not. You'd hear that like, no, it's very important to be in person. It's very important for our mental health to socialize. And then you'd hear, oh, the COVID numbers are going up and every, everybody's getting sick. It's so um, life threatening, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of confusion. Um, so I was just sort of wondering if this was actually going to be yet another stressful transition, another stressful event that wouldn't necessarily allow people to recover as, as the government was indicating that we would. So that was really just my my question is like are we <laughs> are young people recovering? Um or in general I wanted a better sense of the trend of their um their mental health functioning. And the other thing we looked at, I guess we can use this, <laughs> is um their feelings of loneliness. So loneliness follows the same trend. Uh, young adults are one of the loneliest groups of all age groups. And loneliness has been increasing over the years. And I'm sure you guys would all agree that loneliness was definitely um, something that most people experienced during COVID, especially in those early phases during a lot of um, social isolation. So again, we wanted to see what's going on here. Is that loneliness trend going to um, flip? Are we gonna see that, okay, now that we're back in person, people are feeling better? Or will it um, will it will people continue to struggle? Like what is what is going to happen here? We also know that there's this bi-directional relationship between loneliness and mental health. Of course, if you are um, feeling very depressed, you might withdraw socially, or you might worry about how people see you or think about you, um, and that in turn actually amplifies your depression or, or makes things worse. Right, so it makes sense to study these two together. So again, we just wanted to know um, if people were actually starting to recover. So for this study, I don't know if you guys saw some of these posters around, but we just um, we did a lot of recruiting. We recruited in classes, in psych classes mostly, um, but we did try to get the word out to lots of professors to, to ask their students about it as well. Um, then we posted physical posters like this around campus, but we also posted them around Assiniboine Community College and just around the community. So they were like in coffee shops and if a grocery store let us, <laughs> we would ask them, the YMCA, um, things like that. 
And um, not just in Brandon, but even in um, smaller communities kind of in the surrounding area. Um, and then we also did some social media posts. So we're really trying to get, get people from this age group. Um, we got in touch with a lot of like club leaders and things like that and asked them to, to post the poster to put it up on their social media. So I think we did really well with recruitment. Um, the downside, I would say, is that uh, we did get a lot of women, especially the first time around. So the first time around, my student made this beautiful poster, and I was like, yeah, that's great. Um, <laughs> and then we noticed that we had, I think, over 80% women respondents. And so then I was kind of wondering if maybe it was just like a little bit too, you know, the purple, the circles, the mental health, I don't know. So we switched it just to like a little bit more of a general neutral color. And we did get um, like a significant difference in terms of it was still, the majority was still women, but I was just curious, you know? I'm wondering if I had done like a red, like angular. <laughs> Anyways, something to think about. Um, but definitely that's a limitation of the study that we'll talk about. Um, anyways, then we had, uh, it was just an online survey, so uh, participants had to fill out an online consent form, and then if they agreed to participate, they would be taken to a second link with the study with some questionnaires embedded and a debriefing statement that told them um, about some, some mental health resources if, if the study, um, you know, triggered anything for them. So like I said, we did have, huh? like quite <laughs> quite a high percentage of women in both samples. So we did data gathering in the winter of 2023. So it was February until April. So that winter semester, oh, I can't use this, sorry guys. <laughs> Just um, and then again in the fall. And the reason we did that is again, like I said, because of that difference in what was going on. So in the winter, I think we went back and forth three times at least. Um, and then by the fall, we were we were all back in person. So we just wanted to get a sense of yeah, what the trajectory was for people. Of course, it's only two time points, but uh, it's still helpful. Um, we also noticed that it was a community size, so people could indicate what community they were from. And most participants were from Brandon or a smaller community, which makes sense. I think there was maybe one participant that indicated that they were from like the town side of Winnipeg, so probably Winnipeg. <laughs> and um, the other thing to note is that it was a highly educated sample. So we did get mostly students in the end, even though we tried quite hard to get out into the community. And this is what we found. So I've tried to give you guys some um, data to compare from Stats Canada from before COVID, just so you can see the trends. So um, we did find a statistically significant difference between the mental health of participants in the winter semester versus the fall semester. And what we found was that um, yeah, people struggled more in that winter semester, and then they started, or they weren't the same participants, but the people in the fall semester indicated that they were doing a little bit better, um, but they still were not anywhere near back to pre-COVID levels. If we break it down, um, what are we talking about in terms of mental health? The questionnaire we used was really focused on depression, anxiety, and stress. So some of those internalizing types of symptoms. And again, what we see is, and I can't do statistical comparisons to the Slovenian data, but um, in terms of our data, we saw statistically significant differences between the winter and the fall um, semesters. So in the winter, people were struggling more severely with depression, anxiety, and stress symptoms. And um, and less severely in the fall. Although you will see that with anxiety, there was no statistically significant difference and no clinically significant difference. So it's still in a moderate range, um, but clinically significant difference for stress and depression. So people seem to be reporting that they were doing better. Um, but again, you can see that 
um, they were not doing, they were, they were not back to normal, right? They were not back to the kind of normal range that we would expect for a general population of folk. The other thing we did is we wanted to see whether the month in which we gathered the data might be predictive. And we did find that it was for depressive symptoms specifically. So um, the later the data was gathered, the, the better people were doing in terms of their depressive symptoms. But it wasn't the case for either stress or anxiety. So it could be that people are, are recovering as as we would like to hope. Um, for loneliness, we see some complicated things. So we had two different measures of loneliness, partially because loneliness is kind of a weird construct to try to get at. So we had one um, direct question, which is the question that's asked by Statistics Canada, partially because we wanted to be able to compare to that. Um, and so it just says, uh, you know, like how often do you feel lonely and always or often would be a three or whatever, and then sometimes it'd be a two and never, rarely would be a one. Um, and we found that, uh, so we broke our data up and we found the same kind of trend that in the winter, people were struggling more than in the fall. There was a statistically significant difference there. But when we looked at like an actual questionnaire that's supposed to get at loneliness, which Stats Canada doesn't use, so we weren't able to compare to them. But um, what it looks at is, it's only six questions, but it's supposed to be looking at a couple of things. So loneliness is defined as um, basically having fewer social connections than you would like to have, right? And so they break up the questionnaire in two ways. One is that you can be socially lonely. You can um objectively have few social connections right you stay at home a lot you don't have people you would reach out to if you needed help that kind of thing and then the other one is emotionally lonely so you really feel sad about that right like you feel like that longing and that loss and what we see and uh and again i think this is a trend that's been going on for a while but it hasn't really been captured because we've only been asking that one question. Um, but what we see is that young people are very emotionally lonely. That's what's driving this. So it's not necessarily that when they came back to in-person functioning, they were like, yeah, there's nobody around me. Of course, there was more people around them. Um, and maybe even they were talking to more people, but they still didn't feel connected. They didn't feel, um, yeah, like they were understood or cared about or those kinds of things. Um, okay, and then the next piece that I'm really interested in, so that was just to get kind of a little story going of what was happening to young adults during that time, um, but of course we're past that time now, and um, I don't know, maybe the trend continued and people are still kind of recovering even further, which would be great, um, but uh, what I really wanted to know was what what was associated with um, individuals doing well during that time versus individuals maybe struggling during that time? Because we see, yes, lots of them were still struggling. Some of them started to get better over the course of, um, for some people noticed that they were feeling well over the course of the year. But um, yeah, I was just really curious about their, their coping and, the, and their emotion regulation. And partially this is because COVID was, and, and those transitions were a stressor that um, was, first of all, very long-term. And second of all, we weren't able to control it. There was nothing that you could do to make everybody be in person again when you wanted to be in person or make everybody not be in person if you wanted to not be in person. You could like wear a mask, but then you had to deal with Maybe other people aren't wearing a mask or vice versa, right? So there's very little control that you had over that stressor. And we know that those kinds of stressors that are uncontrollable, um, they're really hard for us to figure out how to cope with them because we're not, 
we can't use a lot of the strategies we would normally use, like planning and problem solving and trying to figure out a different way. We can't, we couldn't use a lot of our um, <coughs> supports in the way that we were used to using them. So there was a lot going on that was really changing the way that we coped. And one of the curiosities that um, my student and I had was around, um, there's a lot of information about what kind of coping strategies are adaptive and what kind are maladaptive. So basically which ones are associated with better mental health and which ones are associated with more, uh, with worse mental health. And we were wondering whether any of that changed when, when the world was different, right? When you weren't able to use some of those strategies. So things we looked at is exactly what um, the literature has already sort of done before. We looked at adaptive coping, um, which we can call engaged coping. So something where you're actually trying to do something either about the stressor, about your reaction to the stressor. Um, venting, which is where you're just talking to someone about how awful the stressor is. This is considered maladaptive because typically you are actually um, kind of amplifying the negative emotions rather than doing anything about them. And then disengaged coping. And this is the one we're particularly interested in because I don't know how many of you guys would agree with this, but you know, it felt like the whole world was just on Netflix and <laughs> just shut down. And we were just curious, like, is that something that's going to continue? Is that a trend that people are going to kind of fall into using that style of coping? Or was that really just like a COVID moment and now we can get back to our regular social whatever? Um, and so a couple of things I'll point out, which is that we didn't find any significant differences in terms of the coping um, among young people in the winter versus young people in the fall. So whatever they were doing in the winter is still what they were doing in the fall. Um, I had a really hard time trying to find some comparison data. So this is from Poland, unfortunately, but it's from before COVID. And I will just show you that um, the Poland one is in green. And this is the one I wanted to point out to you. So this is mental disengagement. This is exactly the kind of thing like, um, I'm stressed, so I'm just gonna go on my phone, or I'm stressed, so I'm just gonna watch 12 episodes or whatever, right? It's that like, I'm shutting off my brain, I don't wanna think about it. And as you can see, this is quite high. So over a 10 would be um, that participants are basically relying on this strategy. And you can see that before, um, like in, in from this Polish data, before COVID, it was not that high. Although we do know that young people tend to use this um, as a strategy in general, but it does seem to be that they are really relying on it. Um, but yeah, but no significant differences between the, the fall and the winter. And I point that out because I'm going to collapse the sample together in a second. So um, same with emotion regulation. So um, there's no significant differences between fall and winter, except for this one. And we can talk more about that in a second because I have any way to find them for you. Um, but I'm just showing this to you so that, again, you can see why I am collapsing the data set. So now what we did was we wanted to get a sense of um, the predictive power of coping strategies and emotion regulation strategies on mental health outcomes. So we did find just like everyone has found for a really long time that using more engaged coping strategies led to better mental health, using more disengaged coping strategies or venting led to poor mental health. So it's still adaptive, maladaptive is still the same as it was. Um, but what was interesting to me <laughs> is that once we added emotion regulation, uh, coping mostly became, um, uh, non-significant. So the only coping strategies that remain significant was that more disengaged coping would lead to poor mental health. Now let's talk about these emotion regulation pieces because this is, this is the takeaway, I think. 
Um, so what we found really is that, yes, young adults are continuing to struggle with their mental health. They're continuing to struggle with their loneliness. Um, there may be some hopeful findings there where it looks like depression might be um, a little bit lower, uh, stress might be a little bit lower, but overall, uh, you know, they're still struggling. But what we saw was that emotion regulation really over and above their coping strategy use, emotion regulation was what um, was most predictive or most associated with their mental health outcomes. So specifically, young adults who said that they really believe that they're, um, there's like nothing that can be done once you're dysregulated, once you're upset, once you're distressed, you just have to kind of sit with that. There's nothing you can do about it. Those tended to report worse mental health. Those who react with this, or tend to react with this secondary, um, we call it the second arrow, right? This like secondary reaction to your own emotions. So, I'm sad, but I shouldn't be sad. And now I'm getting mad at myself for being sad, or um, I'm so anxious and nervous, I don't wanna to go to class, and now I'm mad at myself for like, why can't you just get up and go? All of those kinds of reactivity to your own experience, your own distress, um, that again was associated with poor mental health outcomes. So the more frustrated people got with themselves, instead of just dealing with that initial um, distress, the worst things got. Um, if they noted that they were unable to concentrate and accomplish their goals or tasks, then they would have um, worse mental health outcomes. And, and I'm fully aware that this could be um, in the other direction, right? It could be just that people who have poor mental health can't regulate their emotions. Um, but I, I, there's something very important here to me. I think that we can, we can help people regulate emotions. So, um, and then the last one was anytime um, if individuals are indicating that they really have a hard time knowing how they're feeling, they're not uh, paying attention, they're not aware, they're not clear on their feelings. They just feel blah. You know, you hear those kinds of things. Um, then again, they were, they were more likely to struggle with their mental health. And then. Uh, like I said, with the coping, it was individuals who used more of that um, mental or behavioral distraction to cope or denial to cope um, had poor mental health. Um, so emotion regulation does appear to be a significant driving force in terms of um, trying to understand and predict young people's mental health. I do think there's a kind of a big push towards emotion regulation um, to try to understand mental illness from like a transdiagnostic lens. So not just like, let's focus on people who have depression. What could be going on there? Let's focus on people have anxiety. What could be going on there? But instead trying to just understand people <laughs> in general, um, which I think lends itself really well to individuals who, uh, you know, we didn't seek individuals out who were, um, seeking mental health services. We didn't go straight to like counseling centers or hospital or anything like that. These are presumably representative of at least a student population. And so um, if we can start to understand what might be associated with their emotional well-being when they're not at a clinical level necessarily, they're just in the normal population, and we can start to maybe make some of those changes so that they hopefully don't get to that clinical place. Um, so we think that this research does imply um, that at least our mental health researchers should be more focused on emotion regulation. Um, we're trying to think of ways, and I'd love some feedback, on how to make some of this information available for students, again, just in the general population, maybe not just students, but we'll start with students, um, versus, yeah, having to go to therapy to learn how to whatever. Um, I think that that sometimes all you need is just a little bit of, of switching the way you, you think about things or you do things just day to day. Um, but again, I know there's lots of limitations. I know this is mostly students or highly educated sample. I know it's mostly females. Um, there was also a lot of attrition during the survey. So 
uh, because it was like a bit of a longer survey by the end. There was fewer people who were participating than at the beginning. Um, but anyways, we are sharing the results with various mental health groups and we are trying to figure out ways that we can yet kind of send some of this information back into the community. So one of the things we've developed is, I don't know if you can see this very well, but we're trying to develop posters like this, which would just kind of guide people through not what not to do, because it's always hard, but what, what they can do for themselves if they're if they're starting to feel that distress. Um, we're not sure what to do with these posters, <laughs> whether to like actually hang physical posters around or send them out to those same groups and ask them to post it on social media or something like that. But anyways, this is all stuff I'm still percolating on, but I'm hoping to just get more, more resources out into the community rather than having to go to a clinic to get this information. That's... <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Lazinski. And we have some time for questions. Yeah. We will start off with the green and ask questions. I'm be aware that for Friday for a long weekend. I did try to power through. Carter has a question. Okay. Um, yeah, so at the start, you kind of mentioned that there was a big focus on um, these types of this type of research going into public but not like, coming out and like you're doing um yeah. is there is there a way that like or is anyone doing or are you doing something to compare that kind of thing like um compare the so that is that anxious feeling say going into and you that anxious feeling coming out of to see whether or not yeah i think there is some some research coming out um like that's part of why we wanted to use the same sorts of questions um, so we define good mental health and poor mental health in the exact same way as stats canada does um so i, I think stats canada is trying to do some of that is trying to sense like get a sense of whether people are are recovering and i think in general the consensus is that it's like slowly getting better um but it's not where it was and it's not be like I, I kind of have a problem with the word recovery because it implies that we're going back and we're not like we've changed right there's a lot that's changed because of COVID and so I think we need to acknowledge that and it's not just because of COVID there's other things going on in the world but um yeah I think but I don't know why the research really slowed down everybody was burnt out I guess. <laughs> I just started my research career, so I had no, no choice. <laughs> Here we go. Whoa. I think you're onto something here, and it might not, I think sadly it might go beyond COVID. I'm supervising uh, graduate students now. She's looking at different ways of COVID for student nurses, Winnipeg, Brandon, and Vancouver. And when she measures stress, she finds the best predictor of stress are maladaptive ways of COVID. Yeah. Which is, Similar yeah. to what you're finding, just using different. But we keep doing it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they know. Yeah, they, they know. yeah. No we keep they... doing it, and I think it's partially, and that's why I do. I have this because of my clinical training. I have this like desire to dive in and start doing something, but partially we do get a break from like if you disengage with something, if you avoid something, you do get relief for a second, right? You do get that that feeling. Yeah. But that reinforced, like we are very short-term animals. Like we, you, you get reinforced for it because you're like, oh, thank goodness, I don't have to think about that. I'm just enjoying my show, or I'm just scrolling on my whatever. And then it builds, it builds, it builds, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And then you don't really know what to do about it anymore. And so you get kind of into this spiral of like, see, it's not, it's not helping. I don't know what to do. I can't fix it. Yeah. It's gonna do some drawing. Uh, so, <laughs> thanks for the talk. Actually, unpopular opinion. Um, I work in education, and something I've seen over the last 10, 15 years is a real change in the role that parents are taking. 
Yes. And the permit students aren't forced to deal with a lot of things, especially while they're in K-12. So if they're Is not it just K-12. No, but it's <laughs> especially that, I just that's where I work. So that's what I know about. No, I understand. Yeah. Um yeah. so I, I'm wondering if we don't there needs to be more education in this social emotional regulation skills without putting more into schools because there's a no, lot of I don't schools think it now, should be right? more into schools and I so, yeah and I do think yes there's a lot in schools but I think it's backfired because I think what we're doing again is putting a lot of the onus on like you said on on the adults let me regulate you yes you're upset that's upsetting me yes so now I have to stop you from being upset yes um and so the the belief one I thought was so great that was the most powerful thing sorry clearly I'm not a technology person but this belief one was the most powerful predictor if you hold a belief that you can you can handle it you can do something about it if you're distressed you end up doing better in terms of your mental health. Of course you do, right? Like that that makes so much sense to me. And I think that we're not giving kiddos that belief anymore because they're not they're not. We're regulating for them or we're taking the stressor away or we're whatever. Um and so kids are growing up without the the empowerment to feel like, yeah, this sucks and I'll get through it. So what age would be most <laughs> critical for them to start those experiences? Oh, I think zero. <laughs> yeah, I think zero. But but, but the, it's a cycle, right? Because if parents themselves, and I'm a parent to a little guy, like I, I, he had colic for like eight months, and it is very hard to tolerate someone else's distress, mm -hmm. especially someone. So it is a cycle where you can't just start it with a little kid because you, you really have to start it with, the adult who's caring for that little kid and the little kid mm -hmm. has to have it so they grow into that adult who's caring for it. So I actually think that young adults are a perfect place to start because they are on the cusp of creating those those new families, hopefully. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I think part of it is just sort of like being okay in distress, tolerating distress rather than fixing it, taking it away, avoiding it, all that stuff, yeah. It's just kind of building up. Do you think that has something to do with like the inability to fail? Like, do you think that yeah. the people take away your ability to fail or something so you never get a feeling of overcoming that and something? Yeah. Like? Yeah, I think ability to fail, risk taking, because like we're not okay with any risk, right? Um, you hear a lot of anxiety from parents around anything and everything. The kids going to the movies, but like whatever it is, right? Everything's terrifying. And so, um, yeah, I think we're in this very strange contagion sort of effect where everyone's anxious and that's making everyone anxious. And we saw that in COVID as well, right? We all kind of like, don't talk to me, don't look at me because you might kill me inadvertently. So um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a big problem for sure. Sorry, <laughs> I think Dr. Rutherford. I'm going to jump in just first one online. Oh, sure. So hoping she can just, uh, it'll come up to the owl. Give it a go, Rhea. Um, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm sick, so hopefully um <laughs> comes through sounding okay. Uh, I just wanted to say I really enjoyed your presentation, and I was wondering if you have any um, insights or predictions as to how your data and results could differ with a sample set that had less students or educated people in it, because I... I think you said it was like 80% were mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. educated people. So yeah, I was kind of wondering if you've seen anything in the literature about this or whether you think um, this, the results you had about uh, regulation and coping are more indicative of students' mental health or if you right. think it. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I, the coping for sure, that's, that's everywhere for everybody. Um, the like what's adapted, what's not adapted, that's been looked at a lot for a long time. For emotion regulation, I don't know. I think that in general, we've been pushing it so hard in, in schools. Um, and I do think in general, our young people are 
very aware of it. Like they're aware of that language. They're aware that emotions are important. They're aware that it's important to talk about your feelings and not ignore, you know, like I hear a lot of this from, from, from people. I don't know if that would be different. Yeah. If you, um, I don't know. I don't, I think it's in schools everywhere. I think even if you're, you know, they do like yoga with kindergarten and like, I don't know, just because like everything's about take a breath and calm yourself down. And I don't know. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's becoming more um, like that language is becoming more just in the zeitgeist, but in terms of whether it would be associated with people's mental health, like my bias would be yes. But that's, I think, more theoretical. I don't know that I've seen literature specifically on, you know, yeah. Okay, I've seen it on, on adolescents, but not on, like, young adults who are not in university. Let's, <laughs> let's see that. That's a good point. Thank you. Susan, I think you had something before. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Um, and then, so you are, you gave the figure to show the differences of, uh, you know, like, uh, 2021. And yeah. also, uh, winter in uh, 2023 and uh, fall in uh, 2023 yeah. uh, to show the figure and then yeah. related it to poor mental health, yeah. right? So that's a really, uh, yeah. But remember, sense. like, the yeah, statistical yeah. differences yeah. are only in my two samples, right? Like I haven't statistically compared to previous samples, so I can't say that there's like, you know, show you know the, sorry, it's, oh, it's this one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like I can't say for sure that there is a statistical difference yeah. here. Yeah, um, but, but it's just to feel like yeah, it's yeah, that's not really, uh, it seems like it's significant, but we still can see the change. Yeah, the change, right? yeah. yeah. So um, you talk about the emotional uh, emotional regulation. I think it's really important for uh, young adults to know what type of the you know the adaptive coping skills will be beneficial to deal with the current mental health. Mm -hmm. And also my adaptive with those um, you know the, those categories will be really uh, you know contribute the for. Uh, Mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my uh, in my um, past study, uh, so talk about uh, the resilience of factors, including uh, memory, uh, belongingness, and also adaptive adapti uh, adaptation, um, adaptability, and self efficacy, and some risk factors such as uh, the feelings of loneliness. Uh, discrimination, uh, so they all are uh, related, significantly related to, uh, you know, the well-being, psychological well-being. Particularly, you mentioned, you know, the takeaway, that point, the belief, right? Mm -hmm. The belief uh, might really are uh, related to mental health. So, for example, um, in my uh, uh, current, uh, yeah, past research, right? I just submitted mean, that data report. So self-efficacy are uh, really uh, significantly positively related to psychological wealth. Yeah, it's very similar. Yeah, so we right? believe uh, they are capable no, of like doing, do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, doing things and also mattering. Right? They think, okay, uh, I'm so significant and important to the communities or the groups. Uh, so they have that kind of you know, positive thoughts and then direct their behaviors, right? So maybe a positive, they are coping with the things. But in, in my uh, study, I didn't measure the coping uh, strategies. Right? Yeah, still... well, I think my my point was kind of that it, it felt like the coping was was not as important in mm -hmm. this case. Mm -hmm. And I, it, again, it sort of makes sense to me that if you are not sure how you're feeling, you're just feeling awful, then it would be hard to pick a coping strategy like planning or, or whatever, like being active about it, right? Like you kind of need the emotion regulation first before you can move forward. So um, yeah, it makes sense to me, but I don't obviously a lot of interpretation of very little data. But. Yeah. 
Yeah. So thank you very much. That's uh, uh, you know the um, the I mean uh, implication and so help the student and people who are experiencing the negative emotions and uh, can use some resource, some some resource, right? As if they can go to the professional uh, counselor or psychologist to you know adjust their from the health or all my the emotions. Mm -hmm. But that's, uh, that's really, really important. Thank you. 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 Things you think we could do uh, better, like at school or like as parents, that we teach our kids better. Yeah, well, I think part of it is is regulating our own emotional reactions, right? So you see it a lot with, I mean, go to the playground or something. You see kids playing and trying something a little risky, maybe climbing a little bit higher than the parent is comfortable with, and rather than be careful, careful, come down, it's like, I have to regulate myself, I have to be okay with it. If they fall, if they hurt themselves, they'll be okay. They won't, you know, like it. <laughs> I don't like it, I don't have to go to the doctor or whatever, but like, it's a lot of that sort of, yeah, like before you're taking care of someone else, that's that whole like the, the, the mask on the plane, you know, the whole thing. Like to, to regulate yourself first. So like if you're in a calm state, then wait wait for the actual danger to be happening before you're already kind of intervening would be my would be my thinking. But I it's it's hard because these are all very abstract, you know what I mean? Like each person has their own tolerance and their own ability to to find that balance and I can talk about this one blue in the face but I know that I don't have a high tolerance for my little guy crying and if you just yeah I think it's just practice for yourself first and foremost before trying to fix it for somebody else oh I'll leave you with this quote okay so there's this quote um for for clinicians to help them remember this <laughs> that Clients are a beautiful sunset to be admired, not a math problem to be solved. So I think if we could all treat each other in that way a little bit more, and that we're not trying to fix people's emotions, we're not trying to um, fix their bad experience because it's impacting me, really, is what it comes down to, right? It's like, I'm uncomfortable, that you're uncomfortable, so stop. <laughs> um, but yeah, just... So admire it. Okay, so right now you're in a you're in a sad place. That's okay. Then you're being in a not bad place, and that's okay too. And I'm still here, and I'm not leaving, and I'm not, you know, reacting to it or telling you that you should feel ashamed because you feel that way or something like that. Like there's those extra pieces. It's just just tolerance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So I think I. Then I'll acknowledge that I'm coming at it very much from my life. So I'm a yeah, conservation yeah. biologist, so I'm well aware of climate change yeah. and the fact that things are not on fire. Like, yes. yes. anybody's Lit literally on fire. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's <laughs> something that I've been very curious about. And I had a lot of conversation. My son is 24, so, you know, a lot of conversations about this. And, and then I've been very curious about how to de kind of decouple that because. Some of what I'm wondering about is things that are being attributed to COVID were actually just yeah, yeah, the yeah. world is was yeah, unraveling. Yeah. There's much more going on. Right? Yeah, and it's it's climate yeah. change. It's so I'm, I know politics. That's it's, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, not within the scope of your study. Yeah. And again, just more a curiosity if in the literature if this is something yes, that's being it is very out. much yeah. and I think that in general like that kind of goes back to like young people are really struggling they're really struggling and they have a lot to struggle about like it's it's a legitimate struggle and we won't get anywhere if we all stay trapped in the let's just watch Netflix because I can't handle it kind of phase right um, and it's tempting, it's so tempting, and I don't like 
blame anybody for it, but um, and you hear a lot of young people say like, well, like you ruined it. So I, what do you want from me kind of thing? And again, not really fair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, here we are, right? And it's a very, um, again, in, in clinical work, there's this idea of like parallel process. So what's happening with the client and the clinician is often the same thing that's happening with the client in their other parts of their life. And I would say very clearly what's happening with like parents and their kids is very similar to what's happening in the world in general, right? Like we're all just overwhelmed <laughs> by how much is going wrong and just, just need it to stop, right? We just need it to stop. And so I think if parents are trying to avoid their kids' negative reactions and so here, just have a cookie, fine, just don't, I don't want to hear it. Um, that snowballs and it's because they themselves are overwhelmed and not able to regulate and just want to watch TV and zone out and you know it's just like a upward process so yes I would say absolutely that's having a huge impact um I don't know what to do with it but you know, neither does anybody else <laughs> I didn't want to ask uh, one question you mentioned that um if someone believes that there's no way of actually dealing with their distress, like there's nothing that actually actually can be done, that would result in worse mental health. Similarly, with trying to use distractions to cope with your distress, mm -hmm. do you think the fact that like during COVID, one of the easiest ways of access, like one of the easiest things you could do to de-stress was effectively distract yourself, yeah. and that was extremely temporary. Do you think that could have subconsciously led to people believing there's no way of dealing with that distress? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think in general, young people tend to use distraction like much more so than any other age group. So there's something there already. Um, but yes, I think that's where we all went during COVID. And again, I said it's like it's a long term stressor we had no control over, right? So whatever, like we all just were surviving. The problem comes when it's over but we're all still using those strategies um, and we know they're not helping, right? So it's this kind of like, okay, how do we, yeah, how do we start to take something away? But in order to take something away, you kind of have to replace it first, right? You have to have other ideas. And I think part of it is that all the ways that we're used to like I don't know, even just face-to-face -face social interaction. It's not just COVID, right? Like we have phones now. <laughs> I walk into a classroom and it's dead silence before a class starts because everyone's on their phone. And that's that's fine. That's just how it is. But I do think that that means that then you're, if you're less likely to interact, then you're not practicing those skills, then it's more anxiety provoking and your social skills are worse and then you're less likely to interact and then on and on and on and same with all the other people around you, right? So I, I just yeah. I think that it's it's bigger than just COVID, but I think COVID maybe like kind of started us on this trend that we now are having a hard time maneuvering out of, <laughs> yeah. But I, yeah, that's just my thing. Go eat snacks. Go outside. <laughs> Speaking of the world. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe the last question for me. Uh, so it's good uh, to hear, you know, the secondary emotional uh, regulation. I saw you you talk about the secondary emotional uh, regulation. So, um, so as a clinician, I saw you you think uh, so. What type of uh, strategies for students, uh, young adults, who have that um, you know the emotional moment? Um, and uh, what type of the efficient the strategy, coping strategy, yeah. uh, will be used to really efficient to stop that, yeah, stop that, 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 that guilt or that, that anger or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think the the movement right now is around self compassion, mm -hmm. um, but again, that's like a very. I think for me, it's just validation. Like it's just sort of saying like emotions are emotions. I'm allowed to feel this way. That's okay. 
Um, that's sort of what I try to get at with this. Mm, not, it's not very big, so I don't think you guys can see it very well, but it's like acknowledge, label, validate, accept, soothe, and continue. So the idea being that, yeah, like, hey, I'm distressed, this is why, this is exactly what it is that I'm feeling, I'm labeling it, and it doesn't sort of end there, right? Like, I think a lot of the time it ends there, um, and then people get sort of like, oh, and now, like, I shouldn't feel this way, I'm going to go watch TV, so I don't have to deal with it. But really, it's like, it's okay to feel that way, it doesn't matter what you're feeling, it doesn't matter, it's just a feeling, it's okay. Um, and then you you sort of find ways to like maybe soothe yourself, right? So in here we have some strategies around like just uh, smelling something or looking at nature, going for a walk, or whatever. You soothe your body, and then you do some small thing towards a goal, right? And that's probably the self efficacy piece mm -hmm. that that you're noticing where. If you can start to shift, not into, I'm not thinking about it, but shift into what is it about my life or me or whatever that I still want. And you can focus on that. And even if it's just a small thing, right? Like I took a shower, <laughs> like I wrote a to-do list or whatever. Um, it can just kind of get you on that, that path to, um, and remember the goal is not to, to stop feeling distressed. And I think that's part of the problems. We have this goal all the time of like, like never feel sad or I can never feel upset or mad, but you will. <laughs> um, so the goal is just like, how do I keep living a life worth living despite that feeling that's temporary right now? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so like, uh, you know, like what we talk about, okay, the climate change, right? Yeah. So, we, so um, yeah, acceptance. Right, so yeah, but maybe there is one small thing that you can do that makes you feel a little bit more like, you know, like I picked up some trash at the beach or whatever. And like, yeah, it's not solving climate change, <laughs> but it makes me feel like I'm doing something that's contributing towards a, a value that I have. And yeah, I think that's more important than this so I'm gonna there's this like beach ball analogy where if your emotions are a beach ball that you keep pushing under the water and you're like, do, 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 and then eventually it like flies in your face. But if you can just like let it float there, then it's just there with you and that's okay. It's not hurting you. It's not, you know. It's... <laughs> so, uh, one more question. Hey. I think we'll end uh, with the chair's question. Um... <laughs> My question is more around your data analysis. <laughs> I, think, um, <laughs> I think everyone here has probably taken a basic like statistics course yeah. and don't know what statistical significance is. Uh, you mentioned at one point um, you had a statistical significant piece of data and also a clinical difference. Oh, yeah. Would you yeah. mind just explaining what a clinical sure. difference is? Um, yeah. So yeah, so yes, exactly. So if everyone's taken their stats course, um, I put just little stars. I didn't go into all the stats stuff, sorry. But but yeah, so the, this is a statistical difference. So meaning that, you know, within 95% confidence, we can say that probably this didn't happen by chance, right? But I also said that it's a clinically significant difference, which just means that we have over time studied lots and lots of people and put them in these categories based on their scores on this exact measure. And this measure will have scores that will fall into different ranges. And there's ranges that are in like the normal range of what if you go out into the community and you get people to fill out this, this questionnaire, they usually score around this range. And that's considered like, yeah, we all have some ups and downs and whatever. Then there's a mild range after that, a moderate range after that, and a severe range after that. And so again, we would normally find people in the moderate and severe range are like the people in hospital. And people in the moderate and mild range are people who are in maybe outpatient clinics. So they're getting support for their mental health, but they're not necessarily so severe that they can't function. So the fact that we are finding moderate range levels in just like a regular population is alarming because um, again clinically you would normally see that 
when people are needing a lot of help. And so it's a clinically significant difference because they went from one range to the other. Yeah. <laughs> so please join me again and thank you, Dr. Lewis.